welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Foothill College, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Did it, did it, did it. Hi, D-E-W-A-9-J-L-E. My handle's Sherwin. What's yours? Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Our guest this week started out as an old-style build-it-yourself ham in Phoenix, Arizona. He came to California in search of a wetter climate and, having built ham gear since he was 12, began working in radar research at Lytton Industries. Our guest studied the psychology of perception at Kenyatta College and discovered an interest in photography. It seems like he's done everything there is to do in photography. He's been a photographer, run at different times a photographic gallery, a photo studio, and a camera store. He's a photochemist and forensic photographer and has a large collection of antique cameras. He's done research in subliminal suggestion and taught courses in cinematography. He even worked in television. Our guest began fooling around with computers in the days of ASR 33s. His first machine was an early model HP at Stanford. Our guest was one of the earliest members of the famous Homebrew Computer Club and helped build the ETC 1000, the first fully assembled microcomputer product. Combining, compu combining computers and photography, combining computers and photography, he built a system in which he used an Apple II to automate the production of digital paste-up artwork. Betting heavily on the future of digital imaging, he invested in a Tesseract, one of the first PC-based image processing systems. This venture became so successful that his clientele insisted he start Western Imaging, where he is now general manager. And so it's now my pleasure to welcome to our program the inventor of the microwave barbecue and, incidentally, one of the few people actually making money in the multimedia business, Mr. David Krauss. Hello, David. It's a pleasure to be here, Well, especially welcome. with that kind of an introduction. Ah, well, just uh, try to say a little bit about what you've done. So what is the difference between a, micro a microwave barbecue and a microwave oven? Strictly the amount of charcoal you use. Oh, oh That's come the key on. to everything. No. <laughs> You're the microwave leg. barbecue actually was an invention that came out of the uh, intense uh, attempt to relieve boredom by a lot of hot test technicians back in the 1960s that were given too much expensive equipment and too little real work to do and discovered that if you took a, something between 2 and 5 kilowatts CW, at ONX band and aimed it at the lunch truck, you could pretty well heat the whole thing up before you went out to buy anything. Five kilowatts of X band. Yeah, it was a little extravagant energy use, but it would do wonderful things for a donut. What did it do for the driver in the truck? He never said anything about it. Uh huh. I, we but you could warm up the donuts with this. Thing. You could really warm up it a sounds donut. Sounds like it's good for picnics. Oh, it'd be wonderful for picnics, but <laughs> it, the thing weighed about eight or nine hundred pounds. A little rough to carry out into the, the park, so you tried to stay near the parking lot. So with it seems it. like you use it uh, as a transmitter or something. Uh, it ever, was um, uh, actually ever, ever had any problems with anybody here. else uh any of the other radar researchers around no there seldom were any around after we turned the equipment on oh. um there was a, a notable circumstance one time when some people doing uh, some people i might add that had some very large dishes and uh doing some high sensitivity research made the mistake of aiming them down near ground level and right across the section of mountain view where our lab happened to be located at the same time, we were aiming a test rig their direction, and um, the managers of the two companies got things sorted out between them ultimately, but there was quite a bit of hard feeling before it was all over with. So you, it sounds like you burned out some of their equipment. We apparently went through their place pretty, uh, pretty fiercely. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, were you a founding member of the Homebrew Computer Club? No, I wasn't. Actually, uh, I was a latecomer. I think they'd had about five or six meetings before I got wind of what they were up to. Uh, in fact, of the... In my subspecialty of the industry in computer graphics, uh, one of the guiding lights and formative individuals was a founding member, Steve Dompier. Uh-huh, Steve Dompier. But that's as close as I came to Is it. Is he Steve, still around here? Well, Steve went on to set up Island Graphics. Oh, very famous and, company. And uh, uh, is, I, I'm sure, doing very well by yeah, that effort. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, we used to hear about the, the Homebrew Computer Club uh, back in Illinois where I grew up. There was a guy, uh, Mac McVeigh, Used to, he got the newsletter and was a member or something, and used to tell me about what was going on. And, uh, sounded really great. So, 
It sounded like well, a bunch of hams got together, sort of, or hobbyists to build computers. But, oh, it was uh, definitely hobbyists. There's no question about that. But uh, mostly mainframes, I guess, at that time. No, actually, uh, and I, I can't speak for anybody else in the organization, uh, which didn't exist, you understand. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one of the critical tenets, was that it did not ah. exist. Uh, the 700 people at, at, at its peak uh -huh. simply through pure random circumstance happened to come together on these Wednesday evenings up at Slack and it had nothing to do with an organization or any intent on anyone's part. Sounds like uh, anarchy. It was uh, actually it was sort of mildly controlled anarchy on its way to being total disregard for any rules at all. Great. Uh, overseen by Lee Felsenstein who did probably uh, uh, an incredible job as only he could. No one else in the world would be probably insane enough to try and corral that collection of yahoos. And uh, it was that indeed. I mean, it was sort of a three-hour shouting match, swap session, and you name it all at once. So what was your call sign when you were a ham? I was W7DCP, and I'm afraid to say, and this also speaks for the era, that was usually referred to as dirty cotton picker. <laughs> well, that's, that's nice. Uh, now, did you uh, witness the first uh, worked all countries? Is that... Yes, as a matter of fact, well, now, among the VHF operators, uh, right, uh, on uh, Six Meter Band, the first one was done by a gentleman in Phoenix named Garth Gehring. Right. And if memory serves, uh, if memory serves, I've forgotten his call sign. I think it was W7AGG. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But he did the first Six Meter All Continents, and I believe um, was ultimately disallowed when they discovered that his contact for Asia, which was a British sailor operating on a Bombay with a guns, a communicator, uh -huh was bootlegging because India allows no foreigners to have licenses. Oh, constant communicator. You mean six meter civil defense rig? Uh, they were used heavily yeah. by civil defense, okay. but they were used more heavily by people who... Yeah, we used to call them goonie boxes. Goonie boxes, indeed. Right. Anyway, <laughs> that's, I haven't thought about that for a long time. How about TTY? Do any teletype work? Uh, I had some friends that got interested in it early on. I took one look at all of the Bakelite gears and the mm -hmm. oil splashing around the room and the, the cursing that would come out after the first two characters printed and then the thing flew apart again and decided that was a better way to make a living. Well, I didn't really get back interested in that until Don Lancaster published his book on the glass teletype. Yeah, I always thought it was uh, kind of funny to listen to that stuff, the Baudot, uh, uh I guess it's really probably frequency shift keying. Yes, it would have been. And uh, Well, I think if people listen carefully, they'll hear some of that later. So, let's see, um, didn't, didn't your uh, housemate build the ETC-1000? That's right. Stuart Bjornsson in 1974 really began work on it, and by 75 was shipping his first machines. And as far as we know, uh, that was what I consider the first of the revolutionary microcomputers in that it was a small startup company. It had, though it was not in Silicon Valley, it was the epitome of the Silicon Valley tradition. Right. Uh, and it was a complete working machine delivered in operating condition to the customer as opposed to being in kit form. And it well, predated any others that I'm aware of. Such as the Apple One? The Apple One would have come along probably uh, between four and six months after shipments of the first ETC 1000s when I, I'm aware of the first Apple One being shipped. I see. Well, now, the Apple One grew out of the Homebrew Computer Club, right? I mean, more or less, wasn't... Uh... Well, there's no question that uh, Messrs. Jobs and Wozniak were very closely associated with it. Whether it grew out of there or not, then... Oh, I see. Okay, say. well, it's... Now, you brought along something from those days, right? Uh, we have, I think, yeah. here... What is Got this? Got a good shot of that. This is... Well, yeah. A page out of the manual mm -hmm. from the original Apple One, and if you... Notice in this area right here mm -hmm. is the microprocessor, right? which by this time they had already made the decision to label the drawing as a 6502, but there's some dead giveaways in here. If you look at these jumpers in this location and up here... It says 6502 here, and here it says Note 7, 6502. Well, those jumpers could be added or removed in the event the 6502 didn't materialize and they had to bail out and take their second choice, which was the Motorola 6800. I see. I sat next to an engineer on a plane one time who claimed that the uh, 6800 had the exact same pinout as the 6502. But I guess that was no longer the case by the time they shipped a lot of uh, That's of my equipment. understanding that it did not. Uh, the other thing, the most significant difference, and the reason I think that the Apple ultimately became a 6502 machine, is the 6502 had an internal clock. And a diligent manufacturer at that time could save probably between 2 and $5 in parts cost per machine by using that chip. 
Uh -huh. Thus, the decision was made. Yeah, right. I, that's, I understand the exact same thing that happened with Bushnell at Atari. They decided to, uh, he got offered uh, in large quantities, I don't know, uh, three or four dollars a chip. Yeah, which was, which was low at that time. Completely unheard of. If you remember, we were paying $300 a piece for 8008s not very long before that. <laughs> I do, and we burned one out. Ooh. Um, anyway, uh, you helped solve a murder, didn't you, at one point? This is a few years later, yes. We made a little leap in time here up to about 1982. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working uh, primarily as a forensic photographer and working right. with the American College of Forensic Odontologists, which is a $5 word for a bunch of dentists with cameras okay. that go around solving murders and identifying bodies. Mainly. Odontologists. Odontologists, okay. yes. Oh, okay. And we had a, a curious case that occurred up in Shasta County where they had an exhumed body that was misidentified and there was a uh, apparently an individual who confessed to the crime but they could not come up with uh, any proof that a crime had been committed because they couldn't prove that the individual he said he killed was even good and so dead. So he, he confessed but didn't tell him where the body was? Uh, yeah, it? it was a dicey bit of a business all the way around. Here you had a, mm -hmm. a murder with nobody murdered. It's, it's difficult. So what happened? Well, they wound up with a body and no one knew quite who it belonged to and there was no one really making any claims on it. So it went up to the coroner's office where someone photographed it and unfortunately someone who shouldn't have. They did a rather bad job of the photography. Uh -huh. So they took, uh, what, a Polaroid picture? Or? No, actually they took 35 millimeter slides Okay. with little tiny images in the middle uh -huh. representing the only data we had to work oh, with. Oh, I see. So there was a body over there and they didn't and want to get too close. And... Yeah, they might have okay. caught something and so they, they stood back at a safe distance and blazed away. Now, so at this point, we had nobody to work with because the skull and the, the critical portions of it had been destroyed during some tests that were conducted, right, right. Uh, again, through error. <laughs> so it looked like we had a gentleman up there who was going to pretty well walk. And well, what if we, they found some evidence later? Well, if they found something else later, you have the difficulty of double jeopardy. The man can't be retried if he's so it's come pretty, to trial pretty once. Clever scheme. And pretty clever through, scheme. through some inadvertency, he was coming to trial and probably shouldn't have. Okay. Well, at that point, they turned the thing over to... Uh, a group of about five of us. I worked on the optical and uh, photochemical aspects of it. Right. Uh, by which we went in with very intense lights and uh, tried to make as highly magnified copies of the original section of film as we could. And took those and digitized them into the venerable old Apple II. And got this, right? This image that you see right here. Image number 8151. Now, this is a section of jaw showing three teeth. And the part that was really the, uh, the joy in this one is this filling that is a little difficult to see. It's a rather hourglass-shaped filling right uh, here. Okay, so it kind of looks like uh, one of those glasses with a small base and a large top, yeah. huh? Now, okay. that absolutely matched the naval dental records of the person that was suspected of being defunct. And you digitized this poorly taken small picture from way back and were able to get that. That's right. By using noise filtration, we could get rid of... Uh, the effects we get if we'd done this optically, which would have been nothing but grain. That's hard to believe, but we don't see the original uh, photograph. Now, I think you brought something where we could see uh, an enlargement, right. right? Yeah, here we have, uh, well, maybe you want to tell us what this is. Well, first, this is very small. Okay, right. That sort of starts off. We could uh, move in on this a bit. Yes. And this is a photograph, on. purely for illustrational purposes and of no scientific merit, of a cat on my front porch. Now, the cat, which is very difficult to see, is right down there with his face looking upwards I towards the camera. I can kind of see the ears, yeah. yeah. That's about all that's there. Okay. Now, it's, it's an axiom in uh, optical enlargement that about 30 power is where most film enlarging runs out of gas. By digitizing the image through an intermediate stage, as you can see here, we're able to go to a 300 power enlargement and retain relative density information about the character of the eye. Now, in this case, there's really nothing about that cat's eye that we really care to know. Now, that's, but if there that's were, that cat's eye that was originally that was, this size. That's right. And, and as you can see, on piece. that original negative, uh, the cat's eye is about the size of the point of a pin. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a pretty that's, fair degree of enlargement. That's pretty incredible. Well, we have to take a break now. In a minute, David's going to show us how he creates images. In the meantime, let's suffer through this QRM together. The next 30 seconds of silence is dedicated to those with a hearing loss.
My doctor tells me I've got high blood pressure. I sure don't feel sick or anything. They want me to take medicine. Why should I? Hey, I'm tough. What's the worst that can happen? You can help prevent heart disease. We can tell you how. Welcome back to High Tech Heroes. David Krause and I have been chewing the fat and looking at pictures. Now, you brought along some other toys to show us, didn't you? Well, I brought along the things that we spend all day playing with these days. Well, now, what's a Thunderbox? Well, a Thunderbox was really the answer to a series of problems we were having trying to find good computers on which to build PC-based graphic systems. Uh -huh. And this is it hiding here between us, looking like a cross between a safe and a uh, toadstool. And it is essentially a concept of how to build a computer system more than it is a design of a specific computer system. Looks like a tower. Um, it's basically a tower case, and um, almost immediately after that, it departs from what we usually think of as uh -huh. being normal to these. It addresses issues of rigidity, capacity, cooling, power. The sheet metal in the box weighs 65 pounds before we start adding parts to so it. So it's not really a portable. Not terribly portable, although um, my week back will attest to how many times we have to move them over the course of a week. Well, of course, you brought it in here. We've had and then the floor is sagging only a little bit. <laughs> but this is designed in a very modular way. It's intended to outlast, if you will, the next five computers that will be in it. Mm -hmm. It has a card cage that's completely removable that houses the CPU and all of its appropriate cards. And that can be restructured to suit changes in architecture as they come along. So this is something you could actually buy, not have to throw away. I mean, the idea behind it is it's a long-term investment. Yeah, because... Uh, well, I we discovered very early that it is not the cost of equipment or the cost of maintenance that keeps small businesses from being successful using computers for graphic applications. Mm -hmm. It's the obsolescence. Yeah, well, it happens very, lot. very fast. Maybe it'll slow down a little bit as it, as it gets more mature. But mm, it we're seeing true. it speeding yeah. up. <laughs> right now, a computer is about a 10-month investment. Okay, so, so what is Lumina? Well, Lumina is a paint package that really, in many ways, got the whole ball rolling. Uh -huh. It's the brainchild of John Dunn, who came out of the wild wilderness of Chicago. Sounds like a writer. Uh, sounds Dang. like several of them, actually. <laughs> but John came out to uh, the, the hills of the North Bay, mm -hmm and started a parallel revolution to the microcomputer revolution of the 70s in his own right. Only he did this one up north. And with Steve Dompierre uh, operating out of the San Rafael area and he out of Santa Rosa, Island Graphics and Time Arts okay. became the central focus of most of the work that was done through the mid-1980s. But in 1984, I didn't know any of this. In 1984, I just knew I'd heard of a guy with an interesting idea that was doing what I wanted to do. And he had actually published, for the first time in his life, a color brochure, the surefire sign of uh -huh, solidity uh -huh. in the business world. Oh, yeah. So I drove to Santa Rosa to see this thing, got what, and with all apologies to the young lady who gave me the demonstration, the, was the worst demonstration of a computer graphic product in the history of this industry. She was very attractive, I bet. Well, let me put it this way. I bought the computer that <laughs> day. Um, and then found out what I bought was serial number one. Well, and it didn't work. Well, that's, so, uh, should have written him a rubber check. Well, I'm supposed <laughs> to talk about I think he hasn't found out yet. Uh, but I kept working with him on it for a period of six weeks. And by November of 1984, mm -hmm. using a Lumina 8 system. Now, mind you, this is 512 by 480 resolution, eight bits of color. In other words, not quite as good as the average $50 VGA card today. We turned out the first revenue job, which was a magazine cover and two inside illustrations for the house magazine for Great. a large semiconductor so, company. So are you, is that what you're going to demonstrate now? Or? Well, actually, what we have on screen right now is an image done by one of our production artists. It's a combination, and it, it's a very good illustration of how we normally would work uh -huh. with the modern products that are available to us. Started in a 3D solids modeler. The headphones fashioned that way. I don't know. We may cord. have to bring down the lights to see this. Is this that, is that the case? Well, well at any rate, take care of it. the face is a scanned image of a painting, mm -hmm. which has been massively restructured by going in with hand paint tools and retouching and recolorizing various elements of it and adding bits and chunks from elsewhere. Uh, we could uh, just as easily pick up an image live 
from a video source. Well, who's that? On here, some stranger wandered into the place. Oh, oh, you oh. captured that, huh? He's an ugly sucker. Uh, let's uh, just exit this package, and I'll show you the first step that we might normally do from a captured image, and also a little bit of the horsepower of the machine. I've gone into a piece of software by Ron Scott, which is called QFX. Uh -huh. And since we already have an image, I'll go directly to the image control. And uh, you'll see here we've now got a distribution curve, a characteristic curve of the color and, and light reflectance in the image. I'm going to ask for a continuous Very variable nice. curve, and I'm now going to alter this by kicking up the contrast you know, we, a little bit. We had Barbara Fox on uh, demonstrating a uh, Japanese version of Photoshop a little while ago, and I, I was lost for word to what you call this. So what is this? You know, it's in and out, it uh, goes into, goes out of. Well, I think uh, trying to figure out what to call Response this has been a real curves, problem. I don't know. Well, this is a characteristic, characteristic curve, as it would be known in the film industry. Okay. Uh, but it can apply to anything. The, the cameras that are filming us right now have characteristic response curves to light. You know, this S kind of curve is uh, a nonlinear curve that sort of... This is a classic characteristic curve of most natural occurring response devices. Looks like um, trumpets also, by the way, if you... If you <laughs> no, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you run uh, uh, normal waveforms, oh. and as they get louder, then they, uh, they compress. Maybe I've got the S the wrong way. And then you get, uh, yeah, they compress their output. So, you know, it, it limits. Uh -huh. I, I had a friend who did a lot uh, with that, uh, Jeff Elliott. Oh. Who, uh, I don't know, I guess ended up at Time Arts, actually. That's right, and uh, is currently working in association with the fellow that actually wrote the version of, most of the version of Lumina that you saw a moment ago on screen, Mike Higgins. Is one of the, the right. greats of this industry. But you see, now you can do things like this to correct a little brightness, a little contrast, change a little color, make my face a little redder, but it's sometimes a lot more fun to just do something strange. And you can get as bizarre as, as the mood inclines kind of you to be. It 60s kind of look there. Well, all I can say is if this whole business goes under, we've got a great future in the t-shirt area. That's uh, it's a natural for us. Well, and you can work really well. get into another world here uh, without too much effort. Now, as you can see, this is sort of instant art on the fly. A little weak on the art and a little heavy on the instant, but I've just done on the machine what would have taken me probably 15 to 20 hours of work in a chemical laboratory to do by normal photochemical methods. There's nothing I'm doing so far that I couldn't do normally. There are other things, however, especially when you get into the area of running filters, that have no analogy in, in the, the world of traditional photography at all. And that's where life really starts to get fun. For example, let's run an explode filter. I'm going to do it to a very exaggerated extent to make it visible. <coughs> What's happening now is this thing is asking me for an area of interest. I'm going to select my face and put myself out of my misery. If you notice there, I have, well, I, I think I got the wrong filter. I think I used a blurring filter instead of the explode I thought I had selected. It certainly looks blurry. It's blurry, all right. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, let's, we'll just go back and we'll get it on the second try. First, we have, fortunately, the old undo okay. command, the ever-present and ever-useful. Yeah, it's nice and when computers remember for you. Especially when you don't. Right. There we go. All right, now, here you can see the difference. Blur smeared everything in a nice, halated mm -hmm. fashion. Here we're actually taking pixels and sort of scattering them like confetti. Yeah, this looks much more realistic. Now, <laughs> doing this photographically would be a good trick under the even the worst of conditions. It looks like looking through one of those... Uh, uh, Bathroom windows with the, the uh, shower doors. Yeah, shower that's doors, right. We can right. make shower doors with only thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment, as opposed to twenty dollars <laughs> worth of glass. That's what I call a great leap forward. For uh, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to run a forty-five degree. I'm going to try to run a forty-five degree blur filter over the same area, and we'll take those dots that we scattered around and turn them into diagonal streaks. Uh, the interesting thing about this is the tools that we're using were all developed originally for image processing and for data extraction from images for scientific and technical applications. For like satellite uh, exactly. enhancement and so on? As a matter of fact, one of the largest single areas of application for our system is a package called Genesis, which mm -hmm. is used for Earth resource analysis and for everything from determining the, the health and irrigation level and moisture content of crops to locating mineral deposits, oil deposits, 
in determining yeah. whose tank that is down in the sand dune. Now, you have a customer who locates mineral deposits named uh, Wally, right? That's right. What's his name? Dr. Jansen is oh. actually a close <laughs> associate of ours. Uh, he's the author of Genesis yeah. and uh, has had uh, most remarkable success at finding things that the old 49ers overlooked. Yeah, I would really like it to have him on the show. I mean, he seems like such a clever guy because uh, he's, what he's doing is fairly simple. He's top-notch in his race. Extremely and a uh, good old curmudgeon. There you go. Only man left alive that programs everything in Fortran. Fortran? Fortran. Well, you know, they say real programmers don't, don't use Pascal. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, how could you end up in California to come to a wetter climate? Well, actually, I was on my way to Seattle. And I just stopped off here for a little bit. Oh, well, that explains So it. Seattle's a lot wetter. I lost my road map, and I didn't know which direction well, it was. Well, we have to go now. So. Thanks for keeping your schedule with us. Be sure to tune into High Tech Heroes again next week. Until then, 73s. Thank you for joining us this week for High Tech Heroes. Be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week when we will bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Margie Foote, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant week. Au revoir. This episode of High Tech Heroes has been made possible in part by grants from Merrick International of Los Altos, California, Cybernetic Arts of Sunnyvale, California, Linksys Incorporated of West Lafayette, Indiana, and Big D Closeouts of Sunnyvale, California.